Hi everyone, this is Pastor Nadine and welcome to our sixth week with our study of Eugene Peterson's book as Kingfishers Catch Fire. Well, we are coming toward the end of this series of lessons. In fact, next week will be our last one, but we do have a couple more sermons to look at before we're finished. Today, we'll be joining Eugene as he preaches in the company of Paul in a sermon based on 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 to 25, entitled, Jews Demand Signs and Greeks Seek Wisdom. But before we get to our introduction to this part of the book and our sermon, let us pray. Gracious and Holy One, we are continually amazed at the unfolding of your word. We marvel at the teachings to ancient congregations that still ring as true for our congregations today. We are startled at the knowledge that we are still overcoming the same issues even now. Help us to learn and not just to learn, but to be transformed in our actions and our thoughts so that we might truly follow your son's teachings and fully live out the love of Christ. Guide us in our study and lead us in our lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And we'll take a look at that scripture passage now. So if you have your Bibles and want to turn to 1 Corinthians, we'll be in chapter 1, verses 18 to 25. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand miraculous signs, and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As we come to this part of Peterson's book, we are invited to think about Paul in his role as theologian. In fact, Peterson believes that Paul of Tarsus was the first theologian in the Christian church. And he believes that Paul's theological imagination is comprised of four elements. And those elements are submission to scripture, embrace of mystery, metaphorical language, and an insistence on a relational community. So we're going to walk through those four elements before we get to the sermon and think about Paul as theologian. So the first element was submission to scripture. And Peterson writes, Paul is not an independent thinker figuring things out on his own, nor is he a speculative thinker playing with religious ideas, searching for some novel ultimate truth. His thinking is subordinated to all that God has revealed of himself and his purposes in the Holy Scriptures. Now, Paul, when we first encounter him, is not someone who lacks any sense of confidence in himself or in what he is doing. He is very well acquainted with the scriptures. But as Peterson is going to point out for us, he wasn't living the scriptures, he was using the scriptures. So in order to be transformed, Paul has learned to be submissive to the scripture. And we're going to walk through how Peterson describes what that means. So Peterson writes, all of Paul's mental processes are subdued and submissive to what has been handed to him by revelation in scripture. Paul's relation to scripture is not as a student studying for an exam, finding out what was there, but as a disciple of Jesus living the text. He spent the first part of his life as a Pharisee using the scriptures zealously, 
but wrongly. He spent the second part of his life as a Christian living these same scriptures just as zealously, but very differently. The difference was this. As an activist Pharisee, he used the scriptures to support an angry crusade against Christians. As a believing Christian, he let the Spirit use the scriptures to form Christ in him. He submitted to them. The scriptures furnish his vocabulary, shape his imagination, form his life. So there's a very big difference between simply knowing the scripture, being able to talk about it dispassionately, or even to use scripture to support a particular point of view, but not living the scripture. And that's what Peterson is really talking about with Paul, because Paul is actually an example of both, right? As a Pharisee, he wrote, you know, he used the scripture zealously, but wrongly. But as a Christian, he used the same scripture. He didn't use them. He lived them just as zealously, but differently. He was now transformed by those very scriptures that he once used for his own purposes, really, or what he believed was what he was supposed to be doing, but he didn't really understand and live them. He knew them, but he didn't live them and wasn't transformed by them. In Christ, he became a new man. He became Paul. He was transformed when he submitted to the scriptures and let the Spirit use the scriptures to form Christ in him. The second characteristic of Paul's theological imagination is his extravagant embrace of mystery, writes Peterson. Paul is comfortable with mystery, delights in mystery, accepts mystery. So already we have two things that probably make us uncomfortable. We, we don't like the idea of submission. We don't like the idea that somehow it sounds like we're losing some sort of control, right? But when we submit to the teachings of God, when we submit to the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, that is true freedom. That is transformational. That leads to our fullness of life and to our salvation and to life eternal. So that is completely the opposite of what we might be thinking when we hear a word like submission. And now we have the word mystery and mystery often makes us uneasy. Again, it's, it's that idea of control. We want to know. We, we want to know what the plan is. We want to know what the explanation is. We want to know. We want answers to all of our questions. And Paul is here to say, there's going to be mystery. There is going to be mystery. And that that is part of our faith is to be comfortable with mystery, except that there is mystery, because how could we possibly know and understand the mind of God? We know what God reveals to us, and we can embrace and understand that to some extent, but even then, probably not to the fullest capacity. We're, we're limited as human beings. And so here is how Peterson discusses mystery for Paul. He says, mystery for Paul is not what is left over after we have done our best to reason things out. It is inherent in the very nature of God and his works. As the spirit forms the life of Christ in us, we necessarily encounter in God more than we can grasp, more than we are capable of explaining. But the more is not some secret kept hidden from us. It is an open invitation to live in a world larger than our own sin-cramped selves. There is a kind of mind too common among us that is impatient of mystery. We want to know what's going on. And here, Peterson writes, Paul is dealing with a mystery that deepens even as our knowledge increases. I'm going to read that again. Paul is dealing with a mystery that deepens even as our knowledge increases. So the more we know about God and God's self and God revealed, the more we know, the more mystery there is. It gets 
deeper and more complex and it's harder for us to comprehend the more that we know we we still are surrounded by this mystery it will deepen it's not going to evaporate we're going to continue to deal with the mystery no matter how much knowledge we have the mystery paul embraces is not the mystery of darkness that must be dispelled but the mystery of light that may be entered Again, turning that idea on its head that we think of mystery as something that is shrouded in darkness, something we can't see or understand or be comfortable with. And here, Peterson is saying that in Paul's theology, it is a mystery of light. A mystery of light is something that may be entered into and lived even though we don't know all the answers. He continues and says, God and his operations cannot be reduced to what we are capable of explaining and then reproducing. It takes considerable humility to embrace mystery. For in the presence of mystery, we are not in a position to control anything, to manage or pose as authorities. Again, think about how this is such a complete transformation for Paul coming from the life of a Pharisee into this comfort with mystery, not knowing all the answers, not having everything right at his fingertips to be able to control or explain. And that is what we are invited into as well, to learn to be comfortable with the mystery and to know that even as we grow in our faith and grow in our knowledge of God, that mystery is still going to be there. So that is one of the ways in which Paul helps us as a theologian of the early church. Then we move to the third element and Peterson says Paul's use of language also, also talks about sort of that mystery but also helps us to use our imaginations as well, our, our theological imaginations, because Paul uses uh, a lot of metaphor in his writing. And Peterson says, there is hardly a paragraph he writes that lacks a metaphor, which means that there is room for us to look at something from different angles. Peterson writes, instead of pinning down meaning, metaphor lets it loose. Metaphor does not so much define or label, it expands, forcing the mind into participating action. So when you have a metaphor, you have to think about it a little more than somebody just saying something very plainly or directly. You can take it or leave it, right? You don't have to really think about it too much, but when you have a metaphor, now you're invited to participate in that metaphor and to think about whatever it is being compared, uh, being discussed in a whole new way. For example, when we use rock as a metaphor for God, as in the Lord is my rock, which is from Psalm 18, rock does not define God. Taken literally, the statement is absurd. <laughs> What it does is force the imagination into action to find meaning at another level, engaging the imagination to look for relationships and resonances that tell us more than anything literal. We cannot be passive before a metaphor. Again, it's invitational language. It's language that um, includes and invites us into the conversation. Paul uses words not to define, but to evoke. Peterson says, Paul's language is a living energy field. He takes the language of common discourse, redolent with metaphor, common things, common actions, and uses it freely, at ease with the ambiguities necessarily inherent in it. A living, Faith requires this lively participatory language. And lastly, the element that Peterson lifts up is Paul's theological imagination that comes through his ministry in the letters that he writes to the churches. Paul's theological imagination enabled him to keep the soaring truths 
and beauties of the gospel of Jesus Christ accessible and understandable to the very people that gather still in our congregations. Theology comes alive in conversations and prayers, in worship and community. Theology is not talking about God, but living in community with persons in relationships who, like Paul, live in communities whose names they know. So by these letters, which include specific names of people in the congregation and are addressed to specific congregations and discuss what is happening in that community, it is very personal and relational. And yet the amazing thing about it is that it still speaks to all of us and our congregations today. So while it is very specific, it is also very much speaking about these larger truths and these larger relational situations that we find ourselves in as Christians and how do we think about God in those communities and in those relationships. And that's what Paul's letters help us to do. Paul brings people by name into his theology making sure we will not think of theology as something impersonal, something just to think about and argue over without living it. So that is really what Peterson believes drives Paul's theology, is that lived theology. It isn't just something abstract. It isn't something that you just study. It's something that you really live and embrace and are in not only relationship with God, but relationship and community. And that's where theology is found. So theology is all around us. We are all theologians. We all are living and speaking and being transformed by God through his word, through his spirit, through Christ's action and saving grace in our lives, through God's love, we are all theologians living out this word of God, living out all that God is doing presently in our lives. And so Paul helps us by reminding us that we come to scripture in order not to just study and learn, but to be transformed by it and that we come into our relationships. And that is one other way that we learn about God and, and how God works in the world is through one another and in community. That there is always going to be mystery when we talk about God and we have to become comfortable with that, knowing that we will never fully understand because we're limited in our capacity. And then lastly, where Paul invites us to think in metaphor, to think in greater imaginative ways about life together, about our understanding of God's self, about revelation of God through Christ and the Holy Spirit. So Paul is constantly inviting us into his theology in these ways. So we're going to keep that in mind as we come to the sermon that Peterson is going to preach on 1 Corinthians. Peterson begins his sermon based on 1 Corinthians in this way. I have a profound distrust of slogans. Anything in the nature of a formula or a pat answer makes me uneasy. For reality is in fact complex and diverse. The world is rich and intricate. Life is sundry and profuse. The formula that explains everything, the slogan that interprets everything, the answer that fits all questions, all leave out too much. The world of religion, maybe more than any other, seems to attract the terrible simplifiers. But there is one summary phrase I have come to have more and more respect for. It came out of the Holy Spirit genius of St. Paul. In various letters to first century congregations, he said or wrote it eight times, just two words, Christ crucified. Not what you might think, not God is love, not love your neighbor, not keep the commandments, but Christ crucified. The more you think about it, although brief, it is not a reduction but a concentration, not a blurring of reality, but a focusing, not a watering down, but a distillation.
These two words, Christ crucified, in this particular instance, appear in a letter that Paul is writing to the church at Corinth. And this congregation is, as Peterson describes them, clamoring, argumentative, and cantankerous. Each person, it seemed, had a different idea of how to interpret or express the Christian faith. It was Paul's task as their pastor to make sense out of it all, to shape their diversity into a unity, to turn their confused complexity into an organic harmony. Well, part of the problem was that some of the congregation really wanted to stress education. In fact, they talked about turning the church into a lecture hall. After all, they were surrounded by great philosophers and moralists, but they wanted to be able to talk about how in Christ we have all the wisdom of God. So they really wanted to stress education. But another part of the congregation was really trying to emphasize more the miraculous or the supernatural. They were, in fact, also surrounded by other religions that put a high value on such things. So what they were thinking, as Peterson writes, is all we have to do is demonstrate a bigger and better miracle and we will have the whole city standing on tiptoe, breathless with excitement. And so the congregation is constantly discussing and arguing over these two perspectives. And Paul, of course, hears about it, and he writes to them in a letter, and he simply says, we preach Christ crucified. Now, Peterson admits to having a bit of a soft spot for the Church of Corinth, and he writes, there are 17 Christian congregations in the first century that we know something about, some more than others. Of all of them, the congregation in Corinth is my favorite. It is not the best, it is not the most influential, it was not the largest, it was not the most strategic, but it was the earthiest. There seemed to be more going on in Corinth than any place else, a mixture of sin and grace and emotion. Anything that can go wrong in a congregation went wrong there. But nearly everything that can go right in a congregation went right there too. Forgiveness, a deeply felt life centered in acts of baptism and the Eucharist, passionate acts of reconciliation, reckless generosity in the giving of offerings, and a determination to live the life of the Spirit in community. First century Corinth and 20th century Bel Air, which is where he was preaching as pastor at the time, he says they don't share much socially. But in a lot of other things that matter, the things that always matter and will never quit mattering, we are together. To begin with, we owe our origin, our root existence, to something that happened. What happened? Christ was crucified. Those two words, Christ crucified. What Paul writes to the church in Corinth that is divided and arguing over how to proceed, he writes back, we preach Christ crucified. And here Peterson is coming back to that idea that this is central, this is unifying, this is where we organically rise as a church, Christ crucified. And as Peterson points out, nobody wants to start here. Nobody wants to start with Christ was crucified. We want to start with a big idea like God is love, there is purpose to life, or maybe some sort of grand vision, or some sort of challenge, or even a rebuke. But Christ crucified? Who wants that? Well, Paul looks at this in relation to the community that he is serving, this church in Corinth that has somehow divided itself along these lines of those who either seek signs or miracles, or those who are putting the emphasis on education and knowledge, really putting the emphasis on knowledge. And Peterson writes, our society is cheapened by expectations of miracles. God is a supernatural shortcut, so we don't have to engage in the deeply dimensioned, endlessly difficult, soaringly glorious task of being a human living by faith. 
So God, he proposes, Peterson proposes, does not want us grounded in miracles, not grounded with signs and miracles, which would be power without relationship, spectacular entertainment without relationship, writes Peterson. And he also believes that God does not want us grounded just in knowledge and not with ideas and wisdom, knowledge without relationship, information without involvement. And this is what Paul is driving at, saying that we preach Christ crucified. Something actually happened, writes Peterson. Something actually happened, not an idea we can ponder and study, not a power we can manipulate and put to use, but a fact, a historical time and place fact, a person fact, Christ crucified. This is the anchor, writes Peterson, but this is the anchor, writes Paul too, when he writes to those churches in Corinth, he is saying, we are not putting our stake in the ground in knowledge of God, and we are not putting all of our emphasis on the miracles of God. We, we know about them. We are awed and amazed by them, but that is not how our faith is grounded, not simply on signs and wonders. Our anchor is Christ crucified. Paul is writing to a mixed but intensely religious community, these Corinthians who are clamoring for answers and curious about miracles, not so different from us, really. He brings them back to what anchors their lives, Christ crucified. He goes on to say, the issue is this, that we give our full attention to what God has done among us. He came to us, revealed his love to us, demonstrated his commitment to save us and to restore us to himself. He offered himself as the sacrifice that would give us back our true selves. A real life, a real death, and God in it showing his passionate love for us and working his salvation in us. And this is what Paul is really trying to say to this church in Corinth. We have to stay anchored in Christ crucified. Christ's saving act. That is what separates our faith from all of these others. A God who came incarnate, who lived fully, and we talked about that I think in last week's lesson, fully human, fully divine, who died was buried, and after the third day, he rose again from the dead. A real life, a real death, and a real resurrection. But here, Paul is saying we're preaching Christ crucified. God does not act impersonally. He does not speak impersonally. So don't expect miracles and don't clamor for answers. Pay attention to God in the Word made flesh. Pay attention to Christ crucified, his sacrificial offering for you. And that is how Peterson ends his sermon to his congregation at Bel Air. And so that is an interesting way, of this distillation of theology in this particular uh, letter to the church in Corinth is just to say, we preach Christ crucified. Our understanding is a very personal and intimate God who came to be with us, who dwelt among us, who died for us. And that makes our God completely different from any other God that has been known or is being worshipped somewhere in the city or somewhere in the world at that time. Our God is different. Our God sacrificed himself for us. This is what we preach and this is how we live in this understanding of all that God has done for our sake. And so we embrace and live this out fully. And I think this is where in that introduction, Peterson talked about Paul's submission to scripture, that this is one example of that, submitting to that 
life of sacrifice that we are also called to give ourselves away daily in the name of Christ, to be generous and loving and kind in the name of Christ, to pour ourselves out in the name of Christ, and to come back to that idea of Christ crucified really does sort of encapsulate that teaching, that giving away. That is not an emptying, but actually becomes a fullness of life. And so we can think about that, just those two words, Christ crucified. I hope that that will be something that you ponder and meditate on during the week to come, and that you will come back and join me again for our last lesson with Eugene Peterson's book, As Kingfishers Catch Fire. And we will conclude with one of his sermons preaching in the company of John. So come back next week, and until then, take care, be well, and God bless.